Warning! The following video is not for kids. Please don't show it to kids. Oh god, I swear so much. And I say the word jizz a non-zero number of times. Warning number two. I did warn you about this last time, which in retrospect seems optimistic to the point of farce, but it bears repeating regardless. This video series analyzes a Christian media franchise from a queer, leftist, Jewish, atheist, fucking anarcho-socialist, communist, so far to the left you'll break your fucking neck trying to look at me perspective. If you think that's gonna make you angry, take care of yourself. Go light a scented candle and pour yourself a bath. Put on some soft silky pajamas, avail yourself to the fainting couch in the parlor, and page through an old book of poems as your husband plays a distant plaintive tune on the violin in the other room. And then try jizzing! Hello! And welcome back to Does Veggie Tales Hold Up? The video series where we critique and analyze the entire Veggie Tales oeuvre from start to finish, uh, uh, alpha to omega, genesis to revelations, Mouth to butthole. Anyway, we've got a truly staggering amount of ground to cover today, so without further ado, let us dive right in. And uh, after diving in, we immediately land on the wrong foot with... Bob, Bob, are you okay? Mousetrap. Huh? I wanted to play Mousetrap. You roll your dice, you move your mice. Nobody gets hurt. <laughs> Life is nothing but an endless game of mousetrap. You roll your dice, you move your mice, you repeat until you die. In this pitiful existence, there is only one question that gives us even a modicum of control over this careening sled we call life. So tell me, Larry, will you be the mouse? Or will you be the trap? Yeah, okay, so it's time to say those three little words. Um, I hate Christmas, and not like in the fun uh, Grinch slash Scrooge way, where like I have a specific Christmas-related trauma and eventually my shriveled heart will grow three sizes and I'll get over it. In fact, if I ever do have a Christmas-related musical epiphany, I, I want you to come to my house and shoot me in the face. I have nothing against the Goyim celebrating Christmas in the privacy of their own homes. That's why we have freedom of religion, but to shove it in my fucking face every time I go outside for a solid month and a half out of every year. And the worst thing, of course, is, you know, I'll like, I'll like walk into a building lobby or a grocery store, and of course it looks like Santa Claus jizzed all over the walls, but in the corner, in the corner they put a little table, and on the table is a cute little electric Hanukkah menorah. As if that will appease me. As if that will, like, quell the rage in my heart. As if I asked to be included in this fakachte display of pure unbridled capitalism. Ooh, okay, I'm sorry. I have to actively pinch off this rant or else we'll be here all night. My point is that any piece of Christmas media has to work twice as hard to entertain me as opposed to someone who might actually get caught up in the warm, fuzzy Christmas feel. There are Christmas tales that I enjoy. A Christmas Carol is a delightfully chilling ghost story. The Netflix movie Klaus is an absolute masterpiece that legit made me cry. And Phineas and Ferb's Christmas Vacation is quite possibly the best thing that has ever existed. <laughs> The toy that saved Christmas is very clearly Big Idea's first attempt to create a well-loved animated Christmas special in the footsteps of The Grinch Who Stole Christmas or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. The trouble is that the narrative is a bit too clunky and awkwardly assembled to have much staying power, and the rudimentary CGI of the 90s is a bit too restrictive to imitate the visual splendor of much 20th century Christmas fare. We begin with a framing device that I actually really like. This is the first veggie Tail not to open with a countertop scene with Bob and Larry. And I appreciate that whenever VeggieTales does break this format, they always try to at least keep the element of an adult telling a child a story in order to help them learn something. So Grandpa George is tucking in his granddaughter Annie at bedtime, and at her request, he tells the story of a town called, um, uh, Dinkletown? 
Okay. Do you know the Muffin Man? He lives on Piss Avenue. All the neighborhood kids are very excited for Christmas to arrive, but trouble is on the horizon as Mr. Nezer appears on the television with a new toy named Buzzsaw Louie. Nezer quickly convinces the children that the meaning of Christmas is receiving dope presents in general and buying his toy in specific. This immediately transforms the children into whining crybabies who won't stop annoying their parents until they get a Buzzsaw Louie toy for Christmas. As someone who grew up surrounded by wealthy Goyesha children, I can confirm that this does indeed happen. Anyway, Mr. Nezer couldn't be more chuffed and lets the mask slip a little. We've got money to make, and that's what Christmas is all about. Okay, so the anti-consumerist themes here are, let's be kind and say, not subtle. Companies have a vested interest in lying to you and convincing you that their product is the only way you will be happy. I think this is demonstrated a bit more gracefully in other VeggieTales, but you know, whatever, it's Christmas, subtlety dies the week before Thanksgiving. Regardless, one of the Buzzsaw Louis coming off the assembly line suddenly gets woke, literally and figuratively, and after singing a cute song about how there's gotta be more to Christmas, he breaks out of his box and escapes. The next day, he runs into Bob, Larry, and Junior, who are engaging in some extreme sledding. Our four heroes, finally assembled, it admit their cluelessness as to the actual meaning of Christmas. So they go to see George, who kindly informs them that the true meaning of Christmas is Christ, which, you know, it was right in the name, you guys. Come on. So the central tension of the story has kind of been resolved by this point, right? The whole I Want song was about wanting to know the true meaning of Christmas, and not even ten minutes later we have our answer. So what do we do now? Well, the kids of Dinkletown are still being all whiny, so, you know, we got to spread the message. Can't stop the signal now. Great, we did that. We broke into Mr. Nezer's TV studio, made our own commercial, and everyone came around instantly. Shit, we still got 10 minutes of runtime left. Okay, fucking, uh, new central tension. Uh, Mr. Nezer discovered our cunning plan, and now he's gonna kill us. Ew, he's just gonna kill us. He's gonna drop us down a chute and kill us dead. But wait, the townspeople have arrived, and they made Mr. Nezer a teddy bear, so that's nice, and he is instantly cured of his capitalistic misanthropy. Ah, fuck, we still got seven minutes of runtime? Jesus Christ. Okay, um, uh, sled. Sled. He's on a sled. He, we put him on a sled by accident. Now he's, he's gonna, he's sliding down the mountain, he's gonna fall into a ravine and die. But hey, you know, actually, it's fine. It's cool. Buzzsaw Louie and the Penguins saved him. Buzzsaw Louie and the Penguins would be an incredible name for a jazz quartet. Point is, I'm getting narrative whiplash. We just cycled through like four different narrative tensions, and that last one legitimately had nothing to do with the lesson here. Also, did the titular toy even save Christmas? Sure, he saved Mr. Nezer at the end there, but I think we can all agree Christmas would have been fine. George helped save Christmas by having the relevant information on hand. Junior arguably saved Christmas by spearheading Operation Can't Stop the Signal. How did this toy save Christmas? And I'm not even gonna get started on the fact that he looks like a human when there's no humans in this world. We don't even have time to crack open that can of beans. <sighs> Anyway, very briefly. I can't believe it's Christmas slaps, there must be more to Christmas does not slap, and oh Santa slaps. The toy who saved Christmas has some cute moments, but overall this one is just kinda eh. The anti-consumerist moral is so obvious and self-explanatory that once we learn it, the narrative just kinda has to keep trundling forward, giving everything in the episode's back half a distinct savor of anti-climax. If you're jonesing for a VeggieTales rewatch, I might give this one a skip. And now it's time for Silly Songs with Larry, the part of the show where, and I cannot stress this enough, Larry comes out and sings a silly song. So, because the songs were such a popular and integral part of the Veggie Tales brand, occasionally Big Idea Productions would put out episodes that were compilations of songs from previous Veggie Tales outings, with a framing device just kind of thrown in there to give the proceedings a little bit of shape. I originally wasn't going to cover these until I realized that they contain two silly songs that are absolutely iconic, one of which would go on to define the franchise franchise's two theatrical 
theatrically released movies. Despite this, the narratives here are deliberately thin and not super ripe for analysis, so we're just gonna power through all of them real quick. First, we have Very Silly Songs from 1997. The framing device here is that while Bob and the French Peas are on the same page about doing a sing-along episode, Larry cannot seem to get his head in the game and starts doing the intros for consecutively a fitness video, a home improvement video, and a video about, a uh, real estate? Are you ready to make millions of dollars in real estate with no money down? Oh god, he's gonna try and pitch me an app, isn't he? This framing device is hilarious, and I love it. The new silly song is called The Pirates Who Don't Do Anything. This one slaps, and it's great. My only quibble is that... <laughs> Everybody gives Larry shit for not having enough piratey things in his verse, but what the hell is Pa Grape doing? Well, I've never been to Greenland, and I've never been to Denver, and I've never buried treasure in St. Louis or St. Paul, and I've never been to Moscow, and I've never been to Tampa, and I've never been to Boston in the fall. Of the seven places mentioned, none are, to my knowledge, associated with pirates in the popular imagination. You couldn't name one place in the Caribbean? And five of these are just mid-sized American cities. Denver is landlocked, for Christ's sake. What's happening? Is Mr. Lunt the only one who did any pirate research before filming? Jesus Christ. Next we have The End of Silliness from 1998. Silly Songs with Larry has been cancelled. Yes, cancelled by the politically correct Hollywood woke brigade. Larry is newly unemployed and very sad because he's been bullied off of Twitter. Twitter, and he's gonna come back in two years with a Netflix stand-up special called Trigger. But for now, he's drinking away his sorrows in a cafe, and the bartender, Jerry Gord, plays him a bunch of silly song music videos in an attempt to cheer him up. This whole thing is obviously an extended visual reference to the Edward Hopper painting Nighthawks, and, you know, it's entertaining enough, it's fine, it's not as good as the first one. The new silly song is, of course, the timeless classic, The Yodeling Veterinarian of the Alps. Kurt Heineke is once again absolutely flexing with the instrumentation, layering in lots of delightful brass lines, and just kind of having a grand old time. I don't need to tell you how good this one is, but speaking of accidental anti-capitalist theme, this song is kind of a dire warning to employers that, like, if you keep taking the credit and reaping the profit for the work your employees do, and you don't raise their wages when they ask, uh, you're eventually gonna get God, buddy, or in so many words. When you go a little loopy, better keep your nurse well paid. Moving on, the ultimate silly song countdown from 2001 is probably my least favorite of these. The pirates who don't do anything make their second ever appearance only to immediately do something, namely hosting a countdown of the best silly songs of all time as voted by VeggieTales viewers. There's some entertaining bits, but it's mostly kinda eh. The new song is called Do the Mushu, and it's just Larry and Mr. Lunt badly wrapping the names of dishes on a Chinese food menu. I genuinely don't get what's funny about this. And lastly, we have The Wonderful World of Autotainment from 2003. This one isn't so much a silly song compilation as it is a visual album that's been, like, cobbled together from several of the VeggieTales CDs that Big Idea had produced over the years. I actually had the Pirates Who Don't Do Anything CD as a kid, and I distinctly remember hearing a few of these songs on there. As for the framing device, uh, I just kind of find it uncanny and unsettling. Where are we? The future. Wow, uh, the future sure is white. <laughs> Ooh, no, Bob. Can't say that. So the whole gist here is that Larry takes Bob to the future. And in the future is this big, weird, spinny lottery wheel that has a bunch of our veggie friends, like, tied up on it. And they're not statues or animatronic or anything. They're conscious. They can talk. And at the start of every song, they get, like, catapulted into this screen. And they perform the whole song, but then they just seemingly go right back on the wheel? What kind of fucked up robot slave future is this? People have joked about how this episode predicted modern internet humor, but I only agree insofar as this offends, disturbs, confuses, and turns me on in equal measure. The videos themselves look pretty cheap and quickly thrown together. The robots aren't funny. There's a tacked on moral at the end that makes no sense and... I don't know, it's all just kind of weird. And not like fun Terry Gilliam weird, more like just kind of... 
creepy constable frozen weird and I don't can we just get out of here can we just leave thank you and finally we have arrived at VeggieTales first foray into the only type of movie we're allowed to make anymore these were really interesting to revisit after a solid two decades of having superhero media shoved down my gullet non-stop like a goose being force-fed for foie gras in the 90s there wasn't as much pressure to be subversive with superheroes and their resultant parodies simply because there wasn't as much of a need to stand out from the crowd. Larry Boy was a small fish, but he was in a much smaller pond. And boy, did I just love the shit out of Larry Boy when I was a kid. I'm pretty sure that if you looked at any of my old sketchbooks from when I was like eight, a solid half of the pages would just be like bad Larry Boy cartoons. Something about the jacket, the purple color scheme, the super suction ears, the fact that he's always portrayed as goofy and low status. I don't know, something about that spoke to me. And I wasn't into comic books at all, so Larry Boy just kind of was my Spider-Man or Batman, which is weird, but you know, it, it explains a lot about me. We're actually gonna knock out both early installments of the Larry Boy franchise right here and now. Because when analyzed in tandem, an interesting pattern starts to emerge. Namely, that Larry Boy and the Fib from Outer Space and Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed are the exact same story. The same fucking thing happens in both of them. Thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. In Larry Larry Boy Boy and the rumor Fibweed from outer space, young Bumblyburg resident Junior Asparagus kicks off the episode by spinning lies and cooking up falsehoods. One of these falsehoods finds its way to a tiny, cute little supernatural creature with a New York accent, and with the creature's encouragement, the lie begins to spin wildly out of control. This coincides with the creature getting bigger and bigger until it threatens to destroy all of Bumblebee. Bird. Thankfully, however, local superhero Larry Boy is on the case. He is dispatched to defeat the creature, but despite his sick vehicle and some totally rad gadgets from his butler Alfred, the monster whoops Larry Boy's ass because he's a terrible superhero. As Larry Boy is getting his sweet patootie handed to him, Junior realizes his mistake with the help of a taller asparagus dude. He immediately does what he should have done the whole time and tells the truth, and the monster is immediately neutralized. The day is saved and the city of Bumbleburg collectively rallies together to politely ask Larry Boy to step down as superhero, encouraging him to take up knitting or beekeeping or some other hobby where he can't get hurt. I guess beekeeping isn't great for that. So, obviously, Larry Larry Boy Boy and the rumor Fibweed from outer space is one big metaphor for what happens when you lie. One small falsehood, even a harmless one, tends to snowball into more and bigger falsehoods until it absolutely wrecks your shit. This is a wise observation. Even putting aside the morality of it, being a truthful person is just kind of logistically easier. If you've known a pathological liar, you know they have to put in a lot of legwork to keep all the separate realities they're trying to establish straight in their head. And when you don't make a habit of lying to people, you just have to keep track of the one reality. Now while I love to poke fun, these two stories have very different things to say about the mechanism of lying, and it all has to do with how exactly lies escalate. As we've established, the protagonist in the fib from outer space is not Larry Boy, but Junior Asparagus. When Junior breaks his dad's novelty plate for a dumb reason, he is quickly convinced to throw his friend Laura Carrot under the bus in order to save his own skin. It's Laura's fault. She broke the plate. I tried to stop her. She said she had to demonstrate her apple chopper. How is this a comforting lie, Junior? Apples are people here. Larry Boy fights an apple later. Why would Laura have... You, you, you're, this story raises significantly more questions than it answers, and Hot Daddy Asparagus just shrugs it off. What the fuck is happening? This lie helps Junior avoid punishment in the short term, and importantly, he is swindled into doing it by a tiny, cute, harmless little space alien who, once the lie is told, grows in size only slightly and proceeds to shower Junior with praise and validation. 
investigation. But obviously, since the story is far from airtight, he is forced to tell another lie to cover that one up, and so on and so forth. The symbolism here is simple, but effective. Every time Junior lies and avoids trouble, the fib gets bigger and bigger until he is just absolutely dummy thick, at which point the fib has spiraled well out of Junior's control. Literally, in this climactic sequence, the fib is destroying Bumbleberg. But metaphorically, the fib is threatening to destroy Junior's life, his relationships, his well-being, and his community. That is, until he makes the decision to tell the truth and make amends. I really like this narrative structure. The conflict escalates in clear and distinct increments as Junior's lie grows and grows. It's a succinct and straightforward lesson that I 100% agree with, but interestingly, it's mostly about why lying is bad for you as an individual. With our next installment, we get a tad more complex. The conflict of Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed kicks into gear when Laura Carrot and Junior Asparagus, misinterpreting a phrase that Alfred said in their class that day, come to the mistaken conclusion that Alfred, oh no, is actually a robot. As a side note, I love that last time Laura was Junior's victim, and now she's his co-conspirator. Truly the most chaotic friendship. Also, look at those matching outfits. Iconic, incredible, Slay it, bitch. Who is your designer? My fingers are too greasy for that joke. Regardless, Laura and Junior are overheard by a gossipy weed in the sidewalk who looks and sounds almost exactly like my bubby, may she rest in peace. Like, pop a cigarette in her hand and she'd be a dead ringer. Anyway, speaking of weed, it's time for a new segment, which I'm calling Weed! 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 Yeah, so it turns out if characters on screen say the word weed enough, then it really makes you want to pop an edible. Uh, but I won't, because I'm filming and I'm classy. The fascinating thing about Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed is that once this false statement is passed off to the Rumor Weed, it is completely out of Junior and Laura's lack of hands. The rest of the runtime is pretty much evenly split between the rumor weed's comedic escalation of the lie and Larry Boy's harebrained attempts to defeat her. Junior and Laura pretty much dip and only come back in the climax. Which is wild! You could potentially make the criticism that Larry Boy and the rumor weed does not have a protagonist and therefore lacks focus. But it doesn't feel like it upon rewatch. It feels like there's an emotional through line here. So where is it coming from? I'd like to draw your attention to this this scene between Larry Boy and Alfred in the Larry Cave. Alfred has up a map of Bumbleberg with green dots marking the various weeds that have infested the city. And Larry Boy accidentally pushes a lever which tells the computer to scan underground, revealing that every single weed is connected by a sort of underground mycelial network, if you will. The individual weeds are all part of the same organism. And watching this scene as an adult, I found myself kind of moved, there's almost an elegance to it. In Fib, the lie escalated because one kid knowingly kept on lying for the sake of self-preservation. In Rumorweed, the lie spreads through an invisible information network that threads itself underneath all of Bumbleberg, using the city's denizens as a resource to help itself grow stronger. Now obviously, systems of information that propagated rumors existed long before the internet, but in light of all the shit that's happened since this episode came out, it's pretty easy to read this as a surprisingly prescient treatise on internet misinformation. Now, I'm not gonna talk about this at length because Bo Burnham's inside already exists. <laughs> But basically, if you're not paying for a website that you use, or in some cases, even if you are, you are the thing being sold. And every time you put data on the internet, tech companies are selling that data to advertisers in order to sell you products more effectively so that they can grow stronger. But I'm particularly interested in how Junior and Laura's blunder here reflects a specific reality of the modern day internet. Did you know that the term incel was 
coined in 1993 not by some neck-bearded dude bro, but by a Canadian bisexual woman named Alana. She was literally just a college student who made a website in order to discuss her general sexual frustrations with people of all genders. And like, hey, you know, I've been there. I probably would have been on that website had I not been, you know, negative years old at the time. But since then, as you may well know, <sighs> you know, well, it's all right. It's safe to say things have maybe spiraled just a little bit out of control. There are lots of complicated sociological and political reasons why that happened, but my point is it happened because of complex systems of information that were either invisible or non-existent when Alana made that website. Just as the rumor weed grows below the surface of Bumbleberg, misinformation and radicalization compound on the internet through systems that are often not super apparent. And it does so because companies find it profitable. The rumor weed could not give less of a shit whether Alfred is actually a robot. It just wants to grow. And sure, the citizens of Bumbleberg, who are collectively the real protagonists of this story, certainly deserve some individual blame. But the systems that live beneath them will always be more powerful. And what I like about this climactic scene is that information can absolutely escalate in the other direction, too. When Laura and Junior fess up and start shouting that Alfred is a very nice man, actually, the other citizens of Bumbleberg seem to quickly recover their missing brain cells and remember all the times that Alfred has helped them out. Positivity may not be as infectious as its dark cousin, but if you're willing to do a little gardening, it can also spread. But yeah, none of that shit is what people remember about Larry Boy. What people remember about Larry Boy is the aesthetic. And hey, you know, that's great too. Larry Boy obviously pulls heavily from the Batman mythos, specifically the Tim Burton Batman movie. And while the inspiration is very apparent, with the careful attention to atmospheric lighting and noir-like contrasts, the dark purple color scheme gives the Larry Boy universe a distinctive colorful vibe of its own. You can tell that Big Idea Studios was ramping up to make a movie at this point. Fib was the first VeggieTales episode to use a color key, which totally shows, and Rumorweed especially begins to experiment with some bold and striking cinematography. And of course, while Kurt Heine was certainly allowed to flex before, these scores are where he just really starts to shine. In Fib, the score is definitely still ramping up to the grandiosity of Rumor Week. It's a lot more basic, with a much smaller orchestra and a larger percentage of digital instruments. But a lot of the motifs and musical themes, especially the choir associated with Larry Boy himself, <laughs> are already present, and once we get to Rumor Weed, oh shit does that soundtrack slap! It better be good! This was their first time using a full orchestra and choir, and holy shit does it blow my socks off. Also, Heineke just loves him some muted trumpet, huh? <laughs> Now, I do have to close with a pretty big caveat in re these two episodes' outlooks on lying. And it has to do with something I had to learn as an adult after having truthfulness kind of drilled into my head throughout childhood, mostly by media like this. Which is that, um, lying is good sometimes, actually. There are people in this world who will demand the truth from you, but whom you do not owe the truth. Your boss asking invasive questions about your schedule, for instance, or your landlord getting all up in your ass about some stupid shit. Or, you know, creepy guys at the bar for whom the I have a boyfriend excuse is gonna be the quickest way to get them to go away, despite how bullshit that is. Lying to these people is fine and good and moral, actually, and you'll notice it all has to do with, like, power imbalances. It's pretty thorny stuff that is admittedly pretty difficult to parse, and even more difficult to distill into a moral for children. As is happening more and more frequently, this VeggieTales problem ends up being a problem not with VeggieTales, but with the way we talk to children in general. And, you know, I don't have a solution for that. Fuck do I look like a solutions guy? Nah, no, I'm a vegetables guy. Next episode. And in the promised land, it's gonna be so grand. We'll have our fill from the grill as much as we can stand. Josh and the Big Wall was probably my favorite Veggie Tale as a kid, if for no other reason than my parents bought me the VHS and I spent a lot of time watching and re-watching it. Revisiting it as an adult, however, uh, there's some cringe here. Some socio-political cringe. 
challenge. Let's start with the question. Is it entertaining? Because the answer is quite simply hell yes. The story holds together and has a clear driving force, the songs are quite catchy, and the comedy Oh, oh boy, the comedy is just firing on all cylinders. The French peas are back with their same Monty Python shtick and I am here for it. Pa Grape has an A-plus running gag where he's tired and he really just wants to go back to Egypt. We were in slavery. Nothing is perfect. Jimmy and Jerry build a nuclear warhead in the desert, which how did they get the supplies? I don't care. And I do have to mention my favorite sequence, when the walls of Jericho come a-tumbling down. The music, the sound design, and the visuals coalesce into an impressively cinematic scene that drives home the epic scale of the destruction, making this the first moment in VeggieTales that feels truly biblical in scope. But what's actually happening in this one? Well, in one of my favorite ever transitions from the opening countertop scene to the main story, Bob takes Junior Asparagus back in time to the ancient Middle East, where the Israelites are about to enter the Promised Land after wandering the desert for 40 years. But as they head on in, uh-oh, turns out there's people already living there in a big old walled city called Jericho. So the question is, how do we kick him out? Which, <clears throat> all right, uh, I'm gonna stop right here and say that I do not care about the morality of the ancient biblical conflict between the Israelites and the Jerichoites. Jer Jerichans, Jerifolk, Jerifolk. The Bible is not a historical document, and even in the extraordinarily unlikely event that shit went down exactly as described here, it was literally thousands of years ago, and holding a grudge that long is just really bad for your skin. What I care about is the messages that children watching Josh and the Big Wall in the modern day will internalize. And this story really likes to drive home the idea that this land belongs to us because God said so, and he gave it to us, and it's ours, so give it. God has given us this land for our new home. So, well, you're gonna have to leave. Listen, kids, that land is rightfully ours. The Lord has given this land to us. Now, my point here is not to argue that the Israelites are being problematic. I mean, can you imagine the headline? Extra, extra, read all about it. Self-hating Jew tries to cancel the Israelites. No, I'm merely pointing out one of the dangers of adapting a story based in ancient politics into a cute little video for children without closely examining the way those ancient politics have affected, however distantly, our modern politics. You may not have heard this, but the Bible does have a great deal of violence in it because it was written in a very violent time. And the way we interpret that violence now, in our sermons, in our hot takes, and yes, in our veggie tales, often says a little bit more about us than it does about those ancient people. And when this story is presented this way by an American and Christian animated studio, it comes off as more than a little, um imperialist. And furthermore, I first drafted this section in the spring of 21, and I'm filming this in November of 2023, and from that perspective, it's pretty easy to read this text as a uh, Zionist, given that it literally takes place in Palestine. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay, I'm gonna have to tell you my opinion about Palestine now. Uh, nobody wants this. I don't think it's gonna be fun, but here it is. Uh, I had some back and forth internally on whether to even include this section. Mostly because it's a almost tone-breaking topic for this series. I've discussed plenty of serious political shit up to this point, but I have not discussed a current ongoing genocide. This feels worse, and it's not funny or compelling, uh, it's just horrifying, and it doesn't feel like it fits in my Goofy Veggie Tales video. But you know what? Uh, fuck that. I think everyone should be talking about this in any context that they can. I think we should be amplifying Palestinian voices on social media, and annoying our elected officials about it, and doing protests about it, and heck, you know, even taking direct collective action to But even beyond that, even in context, I've discovered that the plot of Josh and the Big Wall is surprisingly relevant to this issue. So you know what? Let's fucking get into it! In my opinion, the modern nation state of Israel 
is bad. It is an apartheid ethno-state predicated almost entirely on depriving Palestinians of basic human rights and ousting them from their homes. I am a proud Jew, but I am also what is called an anti-Zionist. Broadly, this means that I do not believe that the existence of a Jewish nation-state is necessary for combating anti-Semitism or advocating for Jewish liberation, and yes, this would still be the case even if the nation of Israel hadn't been pulling this shit for the past month and really Really for the past 75 years. This does not make me a self-hating Jew. In fact, my anti-Zionism is deeply rooted in my Judaism, my spirituality, and my belief in tikkun olam. Nor am I the only anti-Zionist Jew out there. There are multitudes of us, many of whom are out protesting on the streets right goddamn now. So that's what I think. But strangely enough, I'm ashamed to say that I came to this viewpoint relatively recently. It wasn't until the spring of 2021 that current events spurred me to actually research the history of Palestine and form my own opinions about it. In my childhood, I had just kind of absorbed the common Zionist talking point that since Israel equals Jews and Jews equals good, then Israel also equals good. And my privilege was such that I simply coasted through an embarrassingly large portion of my adulthood up to this point without questioning that assumption. Now, where did this assumption come from? Well, the most likely culprit is that I spent my childhood going to Hebrew school and learning about Israel in class. And I distinctly remember, in retrospect, that the perspective we got was uncritical and oversimplified and rose-tinted to the point of farce. But honestly, you know what I spent the other half of my childhood doing? Watching and re-watching the VHS of Josh and the Big Fucking Wall. A story where the Israelites, after an extended period of absence, return to our homeland and violently drive out the people who happened to move in while we were gone. An endeavor which the narrative consistently frames as not only moral and justified, but downright mandatory. And that actually moves us on to some only tangentially related, but equally nasty shit. Because all of that, all of that historical and socio-political baggage that I just laid down, skimming over a lot, by the way, all of that shit, that's just the fucking backdrop. It's the framework that Josh and the Big Wall uses to instill its actual moral, namely, obedience. The moral of this story is that you should always listen to God and do exactly what he says, even if it makes no sense, even if it's weird, even if it actively harms you. I know God's directions don't always make sense to us, but things work out a lot better when we do them God's way instead of trying to do things our own way. See, the crux of this story is that God gives the Israelites very specific and weird instructions for defeating Jericho. The plan involves walking around the wall a bunch, blowing some horns, and then yelling. And quite understandably, the Israelites, when they hear this, are like, Huh? I'm sure that would work great if the walls were made out of jello. If you're gonna do a colonialism, you may as well use a big ass rocket, huh? I wonder if Jimmy and Jerry are being, like, paid by weapons manufacturers to, like, hawk the Wallminator 3000. And the emotional climax of the story is when Junior Asparagus walks out and gives a speech essentially saying, nope. Don't trust your instincts, listen to God and do his weird little dance at great personal risk to yourselves. When has God ever let you down before? Don't you remember what happened when you are supposed to go into the promised land, but you got scared and ran away instead? Because you didn't follow God's directions, you had to stay in the desert for 40 years! <laughs> Yeah, okay, the word had is doing some real fucking legwork there, Junior. God's the one who made us wander the desert for 40 years. And it didn't make sense when God told you to live in the desert, even though there's no food in the desert. But what happened? God gave you manna to eat. Okay, so God forced us to live for 40 years in a place where he knew he would be the only source of food? And we're supposed to be grateful he didn't let us starve? Uh, okay. Needless to say, I disagree with this. And you want to know what the weird thing is? Do you want to know? Do you want to know the fucking cherry on top of all of this? This entire conflict is not in the Bible story. I'm fucking serious. If you want to learn more about Joshua, you can read about him in the Bible, in the book called 
Joshua. Yeah, well, guess what, Bob? I did the reading. I checked your work, and the book of Joshua is boring as shit. The events covered here are from chapter six of the book of Joshua, and maybe like a little bit at the end of chapter five. And guess what? When Joshua comes back from talking with the angel with those weird instructions, the Israelites just do it without question, or if there was a question, they don't mention it in this chapter. There are plenty of stories in the Bible about being obedient to God, but this is legitimately just not one of them. What the fuck, big idea? What's happening? The book of Joshua is actually a bit of a morbid read because it's essentially the story of Joshua and co uh, traveling throughout Israel and violently reconquering it. One thing the veggies don't show you is that once the walls of Jericho come down, the Israelites go on a legit rampage through the city, killing everyone in sight, setting fires, and stealing all the gold. And like, to be clear, it's good that they didn't include that. Very little of the Battle of Jericho is fit for child audiences. So it's interesting that in order to make it palatable, the big idea writers had to concoct an entirely original plot. And again, I don't mind exactly. It's a fun plot. But the result is that the moral ends up being the same one that was stated in Rack, Shack, and Benny. Namely, listen to your parents and listen to God, which really just means listen to your parents. And again, I can't quite get behind it for the exact same reason. Your parents are wrong sometimes. I suppose one could be charitable and say that this is telling kids that sometimes you just need to accept that your parents do know better than you about some things. Like, there are legitimate reasons why you need to brush your teeth and go to bed at a certain time and not pick your nose in public even though it's really fun. But again, that's not what's happening here. As an adult, I am able to parse the logic of good hygiene and proper sleep. I don't know what the fuck this shit's about. God seems invested specifically in making the Israelites do weird shit that makes no sense, as if to test their loyalty. And it is mere narrative convenience that his big, dumb, stupid plan works. Now, I'm not interested in psychoanalyzing God's motivations here, because can you imagine a deeper, darker rabbit hole? But I do want to examine the attitude behind this moral. I've worked with kids, and I have friends who have worked with kids. And we all know at least one adult who saw a child engaging in a maladaptive behavior behavior, and rather than trying to earnestly de-escalate the situation, or try to understand what caused it, or help the child develop new behaviors that are more socially appropriate, this adult tries to correct the behavior solely through the assertion of authority. Do this thing because I said so and I'm in charge. This is by no means specific to Christianity, but anybody who grew up Christian will tell you. There's some blame to be had. So, yeah, uh, this moral can fuck off and die in a hole. Instilling blind obedience in children might be convenient in the short term, but in the long term, it's bad for everyone. Best case scenario, this is a severe blow to the kid's blossoming critical thinking skills. Worst case scenario, it leads to, you know, um... I don't want to say abuse, because I don't want to bring the room down even further than it has already been brought down, but, you know... Abuse. Veggie Tales. I absolutely adore Josh and the Big Wall. I get many kicks from re-watching it for fun. But I'm afraid I would not show it to a child. Uh, that's gonna be a yikes from me, dog. Now for the important question, do the songs slap? Promised Land slaps. Song of the Cebu is more of a bop than a slap, and it's more interesting comedically than musically, but it's still great. The Lord has given this land to us. Uh, it slaps, but I don't like it. Keep Walking slaps. The Lord has given this land to us reprise, see above. Promised Land reprise absolutely slaps, and it also has the most Jewish line to ever come out of Veggie Tales. Let anyone have any say does anyone have any saline? <laughs> does any does anyone have any saline? <laughs> Moving on. Because a thankful heart is a happy heart. Okay, so you remember how consumerism is all about making the working class forget how miserable they are by convincing them that products are the key to happiness instead of like social change? Well, it turns out uh, that psychological tactic, it also works on the upper classes. And hey, guess what? Um, the upper classes, they have way more money than the working class, which means that you can convince them to buy even more shit and make even more money. 
I should write an economics book. I loved this episode as a kid, but I was today years old when I looked it up and realized that Madame Blueberry is a parody of a 19th century French novel called Madame Bovary. It makes sense in retrospect, Blueberry, Bovary, but I think at the time I honestly thought that the whole French vibe was just kind of a lark. Anyway, written by Gustave Flaubert and published in 1856, Madame Bovary is about a woman named Emma who lusts for the wealth and status of the French French bourgeoisie, so much so that towards the end of the book, she drives herself into debt buying a bunch of frivolous luxury items, the consequences of which eventually drive her to suicide. Perhaps a tad dark for a veggie tale. So screenwriter Mike Naraki understandably lightens things up a bit and lets Madame Blueberry turn things around and learn her lesson. And instead of craving the luxury of the French bourgeoisie, Madame Blueberry gets roped in by a distinctly American brand of consumerism. We open with a great countertop scene. Larry just bought himself a sweet new ride, and Bob's like, wow, you must be pretty happy about that. And Larry's like, but what about n not? Larry, how much stuff do you need to be happy? I don't know. How much stuff is there? Which isn't healthy for Larry, certainly, but the unspoken point here is that the company selling him all this stuff is laughing all the way to the bank. The episode proper opens with a gorgeous tracking shot following a butterfly through the trees past the construction site of the Stuff Mart towards Madame Blueberry's house in a tree. I love the symbolism here, intended or not. Her house is literally suspended above the world, superior to everyone else, but also more precarious. I'm gonna go ahead and spoil here that uh, every single song in this one slaps. And the narrative structure here is an absolute masterclass in writing short musicals. Every morning, Madame Blueberry greets her butlers Bob and Larry with a mournful screed about how everything in her house sucks and her neighbors all have cooler stuff than her. But suddenly, look, what are they building over there? Incidentally, I love the score in this moment. Kurt Heineke is using a great musical film scoring technique, pioneered, of course, by Alan Menken in The Little Mermaid, using little notes of the Stuff Mart theme as a little foreshadowing motif before we even get to hear the song sung properly. Anyway, three sales representatives from the Stuff Mart show up at Madame Blueberry's door. I love this whole sequence, kind of because of how openly predatory it is. You can actually see the moment where Scallion Salesman Number 1 lobs an insult at Madame Blueberry that he knows will activate her insecurities. The criminal responsible for this decor really should be hanging from the gallows. Look at that fuck face's shit-eating grin. And then he shoots a look to his buddies as if to say, oh, we got her, now reel her in, boys. The scallion salesmen then proceed into the Stuff Mart rap, which, you know, I think it slaps, but I'd like to hear an opinion about it from somebody who, like, knows more about rap than I do. Oh my god, what I wouldn't give to see a CJ the X video analyzing the various rap and hip-hop that occasionally pops out in VeggieTales. Oh my god, I would kill to see that. I have a mighty need! Anyway, the salesmen rattle off a masterful tongue-twisting list of all the ridiculous and useless products to be found at the Stuff Mart, and the convinced Madame Blueberry heads off with them to the promised wonderland of retail. I don't have much to say about the His Cheeseburger song, other than that it's iconic and it slaps, although I do have to express my disappointment that we never got to find out what the hell this cancelled silly song was about. Like, what's going on here? There's a moose, there's a bear trap, Larry's got a raccoon on his head. And they are so, so sexy. And then another thing about raccoons? On the way to the Stuff Mart, Madame Blueberry's attention is caught by a poor family celebrating their daughter's birthday. By Madame's logic, these people should be miserable because they don't have cool stuff, but they're not. I thank God for this day, for the sun in the sky, for my mom and my dad, for my piece of apple pie. I don't want to do this. I don't want to fucking do this anymore, all right? I feel like I'm beating a dead horse. I feel like I'm saying the same fucking thing over and over again. And honestly, I don't want to rag on Annie's parents, who are clearly just doing their best trying to raise a kid while living paycheck to paycheck. I, I have so much respect for that, but like... Guys, dudes, 
Where'd you get the apples for the apple pie? This is a clear escalation. We're getting into Sweeney Todd territory. Anyway, Madame Blueberry tries not to think about why she hasn't seen her friend Emily Appleford recently. And proceeds to the stuff mart, where she goes just a little bit overboard. Pretty soon, the shopping cats made them feel stretched around the aisles. Out the door. And all the way to her house. And you know, we've all been there. This is me when I go to Trader Joe's on an empty stomach. At the food court, however, Madame Blueberry witnesses another scene that gives her pause. I love this interaction between Junior and Dad Asparagus, and how it illustrates a subtle point, namely, that despite the episode's moral, it's like, okay to want things? And it's okay to be disappointed when you don't get them, provided that you deal with that disappointment in a healthy way. Dad does not begrudge Junior wanting the toy train any more than Junior blames Dad for not being able to afford it. Ultimately, the relationship is what's important, represented by their mutual decision to buy a cheap rubber ball and go play with it in the park. This leads Madame Blueberry to her central realization that thankfulness is good, actually. Which, as with most epiphanies in VeggieTales, happens cartoonishly and improbably quickly. At this point, I've mostly come to accept it as a staple of the format, and and the more enjoyable the episode, the more forgivable it is. In this case, it feels earned because the narrative has shown us two contrasting examples of why thankfulness is a better philosophy than greed, both internally and interpersonally. And both scenes are masterfully threaded together with the lovely melody of the thankfulness song. But we still need a physical climax, so whoa, oh Madame Blueberry's house has become engorged with all the useless crap she's purchased, and structural failure is imminent. After a delightful high-speed shopping cart chase, our two fruit friends arrive at the house and the situation is dire. The weight of all the useless crap bends the entire tree backward towards the lake, and boxes and boxes of products are shat right out the back door. Okay, so, throughout the episode, there has been this recurring visual motif of the butterfly. The camera will follow the butterfly into a scene, or else cut away to it at noticeable moments. In my reading, the butterfly symbolizes the natural beauty of the world around us. And I'm not just talking about, like, nature paths and the majesty of mountains. I'm talking about the little things. The sensations and experiences that are always available to all of us. The stuff that's right there if you just look up. Many things can blind you to those experiences, and in this case, it's consumerism. Madame Blueberry has tied her own happiness to the idea of owning products so thoroughly that she's made herself miserable. And that's why she doesn't notice the butterfly until this moment. The moment when it lands on the weather vane of her house, jostling it just enough to let loose this little air compressor thingamadoodad. Like in Plato's allegory of the cave, once you have seen the outside, it can be difficult, impossible, or even destructive to go back to the shadow puppets, to the way things were. And here, the literal destruction of Madame Blueberry's house represents the fact that she can never go back to the worldview that caused her such pain. There's a freedom to that, but also a sadness and an uncertainty. Another reading of this scene, I think, uh, involves some likely unintentional symbolism. Because Madame Blueberry's house, as a result of shedding the excesses of capitalism through sheer instability, is catapulted miles through the air where it crashes into the Stuff Mart parking lot and collapses into rubble. And like... You, 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 you get it. I know global warming metaphors are, pardon me, low-hanging fruit these days, but come on, that's it's on the nose. Anyway, the story ends with a lovely picnic scene where Annie's family shares some of the worst pies in London with Madame Blueberry and company, and everybody sings the thankfulness song. And I have to say, Madame is being a lot more gracious than I would be if I were swindled into destroying my own home. I would be moody for a solid month. But this is a better narrative choice because it drives home the idea that the house is just a house and things are just things and there is no shame in relying on the kindness of your community when you need help. And of course, we close out with some delightfully gay crying on the countertop. Hold me, Bob. <laughs> I would if I could, man. <laughs> is it the lack of arms, Bob, or is it the heteronormativity? 
And, you know, is there a difference in the end? Despite having a similar moral to the toy that saved Christmas, I find Madame Blueberry exponentially more compelling, because it seems to have mastered the art of showing rather than telling. This has been the most fun episode to analyze, simply because there is just so much below the surface whose meaning isn't immediately clear on first viewing. The one criticism I will lob here is that the episode seems awfully confident that the children watching do in fact have all their needs met and have things to be thankful for. Now, now, Madam Blueberry, you have a lot to be thankful for. Good friends, a place to live, plenty of food, and you've got us! But like, you know, poor kids go to church too, you guys, and maybe watching this VHS in the church basement. Kids who might be homeless, or food insecure, or in abusive situations. Thankfulness is a wonderful thing, but it is only useful up to a point. Was this the message that I needed to hear as a child? Eh, maybe. Is it the message everybody needed to hear? I'm not so sure. Also, it's certainly noteworthy that this is VeggieTales' first ever female protagonist, and her flaws are all about being uh, shallow and vain and over-emotional and materialistic. Uh, I get it, you know, it's, it's from the source material, and it's part of the point, but, uh, uh, is it, yeah, not a great look. It wouldn't be a problem if you had a more diverse array of female protagonists. Regardless, I love Madame Blueberry a lot, and this was by far the most enjoyable rewatch. Next time on Does Veggie Tales Hold Up, we stride confidently into a new millennium with our heads held high and a feature film on the horizon. Will our second ever female veggie protagonist be able to pluck up her courage and do the right thing? Can you trans pose a biblical story into the western genre without undertaking all that genre's political baggage. Are women ducks? Answers to all those burning questions and more soon. In fact, if I ever do have a musical Christmas-related epiphany, then I want you to just come to my house and just strangle me. If I ever have a musical Christmas-related epiphany, I want you to come to my house in the dead of night, and I want you to just, just, just get, just kill, just, just squeeze my melon, just squeeze my melon of a head until it explodes. Like, like, I want you to take a sledgehammer and go all Gallagher on me. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? If I ever have a musical Christmas related epiphany, I want you to kidnap my daughter. If I ever have a musical Christmas related epiphany, I want you to come to my house and fuck me. Actually, no, that sounds nice.